So yeah, it looks like we got people filing in. So thank you guys all very much for joining us today. Um, and I see a few names of people who uh, joined us last night as well. So that's really great to see. Thank you very much for uh, joining us again. Hopefully we can get all your questions answered. And yeah, go ahead and uh, if you do have questions, go ahead and throw them in that chat box there for us. And uh, we'll, we'll keep reading them off of there. In the meantime, we'll go ahead and uh, let you know a little bit about ourselves. Um, so we're going to have two hosts today, uh, myself and another board member from Conservation Diver, whose name is George. Um, George, you still here? You want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, sorry guys. Um, yeah, I'm having a bit of internet problems. I got my flight cancelled today, so I'm in a I'm in a hotel trying to find good Wi-Fi. So apologies if I keep cutting off. Um, but my name's George, and yes, as Dad Chad said, I'm one of the directors of Conservation Diver. Um, one of the the many who have come out of the Conservation Diver program in New Heaven and I've gone on to start my own various projects in Nicaragua and now in the lovely Azorian Islands um, where I am right now. So yes, that is me and hopefully you'll learn more about me and what I've been up to uh, throughout this webinar. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, so my name's Chad and uh, I am the founder of the New Heaven Reef Conservation Program all the way back in 2007. And then more recently in around 2014, um, started up with some of my good friends and colleagues from that New Heaven program, um, this conservation diver program. And the idea behind conservation diver is really just to help people who are trying to start a type of marine resource management or conservation marine science program and try to accelerate that kind of startup process so that people don't have to continually reinvent the wheel and and search out you know all the resources and funding they need to get this going um, we kind of have this turnkey system for those people who are interested just to accelerate that process and get more of these uh, coral reef and, and other marine conservation programs going um, all around the world where they're needed so we really appreciate you guys joining us today um, we are basically trying to set these up in order to just we see a lot of young people on the internet forums who are asking how can I get into marine conservation or biology? Do I have to have a degree? Do I have to have you know, this much school? Do I have to live somewhere that's tropical? All these types of questions that we regularly see on, on social media. We just wanted to give these young students a way to, um, to get into this field, to get their questions answered and hopefully accelerate that process with y'all. So we really appreciate you guys joining us and hopefully we can answer some questions for you today. Cool, so um, Chad, can you see the chat window Yeah. Yeah, I got it on my computer, so I gotta kind of turn my head. Um, but uh, yeah, <laughs> let's see, should I, should I pull off the first question here? Good, we're Go getting some it. really good questions here. So, so the first question I have up on my screen is, how many professionals are there in marine and oceanography sector and what are they? Please describe the details. Well, that's kind of a, a difficult question. There's a lot, a lot more than people think. Um, people tend to think, oh, I got to be a marine biologist and I'm going to go and, and study whales or something. Um, it's much more diverse than that. And the implications of this basically the problems that we're seeing with coral reefs and the marine environment are so great right now that we really need it, these problems to be attacked from all directions. And so when people ask me, what should I do? Um, what should my profession be if I want to make the biggest impact? That's going to be a very subjective question and different for each individual person. The thing I like to say and the thing that I think is the truest is do what you love and what you're good at. Get really good at it. It doesn't matter what it is, what that skill is. It could be graphic design or marketing or accounting or, or it could be anything, even if it's not related to the marine world. Get really good at that and then figure out how to use that in the marine world um, to, to help the coral reefs because we do need everybody looking at this, not just scientists. Um, basically, you know, my team is very diverse. We have 
you know, we need people to spread the word. We need the marketing people. We need to change the laws. We need the policy people and the lawyers. Uh, we need to keep everything going. We need someone to manage our fundraising and accounting and all this kind of stuff. So don't necessarily think that you have to be in pigeonholed into one field. So as far as what professions are out there, there's a lot out there, but there, you can also make your own. Um, and that's what everybody on my team has done. Um, none of us got our job given to us. We all had to kind of say, hey, this is what I'm doing. And how am I going to integrate that into where I want to be and figure out how to do that? So I would say don't don't be limited in that case. I think... Um, yeah, it brings it brings into so Anne Anne actually put a question a little bit above that before I started uh, yabbering on in the text um, about how relevant it is to have a PhD to work in marine conservation and what's the benefits of having one, and it's it all comes down and that that's the question that you know people often ask us and as Chad's alluded, our team is so different and so wide varying that you know academic study is one extremely important thing that you need in the marine conservation world and, and your your outputs should be based on scientific and research science and research and you're doing what you're doing to try and um make that industry thrive however we are all of different skill sets and and, and i do believe the why our team works so well is that we're all not of one elk we're not carved from the same tree we are different people with different outlooks on things and um, as many of you will know and if you're doing studies in marine bio biology sometimes people are meant to be in labs and that's where their personality is good for them to be you know and, and other people are meant to be in teach and out there they're extroverted they like to talk and 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 so when it comes down to your academic study it's all down to how far you want to take this as an academic subject and how far you want to practically apply your knowledge and so for some of us um, um our academic level is is quite low for my, myself for instance um i studied at university uh, econometrics and math and maths um i then did a one-year course after i was a professional um for a number of years um in a marine biology uh, setting in exeter uh university but i know why i'm by no stretch of the imagination a marine biologist however using the skill sets i had previously and my knowledge of uh, of other things such as the business world and you know applied applied sciences um i was able to transfer the skill sets i had to a marine conservation world um, so the, I would say, of course, there are benefits for having a PhD. Of course, there are benefits for advancing studies um, within master's programs and other things like this, because this is why programs like ours exist, because we want to help fund people doing these things. And, and the development of science is so important. So we would always encourage people to go down the academic route. But when you're asking the question, is it important to get into the conservation world? As Chad was saying, it's more around what is my skill sets, what can I bring to the table, and what are my strengths? Because they may all be different, and it's all important um, that we sort of use or utilize each other's strengths rather than just all trying to be the same. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. Um, so the next question I have here is is a good question from Yuri, and mm -hmm. uh, Yuri asks is uh, he's wondering how difficult it is to make a career switch to become a marine biologist and conservationist. And to me, I love hearing this question um, because this is everybody at, at our program. Um, if I go through the history of our program, you know, we have a lot of people that have like relevant degrees like environmental sciences, marine biology, marine ecology, and those types of degrees. But some of the biggest superstars on our team, whether it's, you know, New Heaven or Nicaragua, Indonesia, are people who came from elsewhere. I, I'll just highlight one person as an example is our, our dear friend, Mr. Pau. Um, he has contributed so much to the growth of Conservation Diver. And he's a graphic designer and illustrator, and he was working in, straight, in Spain uh making lots of you know intros and, and stuff for for tv shows doing a, incredible work and he just didn't enjoy it and he went on holiday and ended up at our program and did some dives with us and he enjoyed those so he did an internship and at the end of the internship i was like 
I don't want this guy to leave. He's too valuable. Hey, do you want to stay on and, and be part of our staff? And, you know, he's a graphic designer with no history in science. And now he's a published scientist. I think he's got his name on like three or four peer reviewed scientific papers right now um, and has created tons of incredible, you know, graphics and learning materials and all this stuff. And so to me, that's incredibly inspiring um, to see someone who didn't necessarily think they were going to end up here and to then end up in this field and do so incredibly well in it. Um, and I mean, we, I could go on all day with names. Um, you know, Ploy McIntosh was another one. She was marketing, no history of science. She came on one, one of our best instructors after a few years. So don't necessarily think that, that you know, you're stuck in what you're doing. We do prefer, like I always say with our program, you know, we would rather teach scientists how to dive than teach divers how to do science. But if you're someone who is, you know, you're a good diver and, and, and you've been doing it for a while and you, you understand, um, you know, where you want to be, um, you can get the training to get there without going back to, to university necessarily or paying all that money for another degree. Um, if you have that availability to do so that would be wonderful but don't let that limitation hold you back mm -hmm. cool. yeah i mean and, and i would only add to that is i i did the exact thing maybe that you're you're maybe referring to here is switching your career i was you know a city boy um strategy consultant and you know it, it yes i had dive experience i was already a dive instructor i've been diving since very young but it was case of taking the leap and um the reality is taking the first year in that leap is going to be a tough year because um if you can support yourself by being a dive master dive instructor it can really help but uh, the important thing is that you go out there and you go to a program like new heaven or like any of other other programs that we have and you immerse yourself within the training and learning and, and you will learn through the university of life what you need and, and through great people. And a lot of people ask, have asked me in, in the past, what did you do to train? And I, I said, yeah, well, look, I, I, whilst I was still in London, I, I did a, a distance learning course through a university in marine biology to, to get my base level skills up and understanding. And, but the way I learned was make getting, making a friendships and community groups and I think the most powerful thing that I've found throughout my career over the last five years if, if within conservation is the most important thing was surrounding myself with like-minded people and people who had the same mission and and so I, my best advice would be make the leap and find the right people who are going to help and guide you through it um, and people like Chad and all the rest of the team that, that I've been lucky enough to be surrounded by have, have been the ones that have really made the, uh, um, the lessons worthwhile. Yeah, good answer. And so George, I see that the next question here, I think is a good one for you to answer again. Um, it's from Marco. Okay. And Marco asks, um, do you think that with the current pandemic situation, the demand of conservation divers specialized in coral restoration has decreased. Um, I mean, so so for me, I've I, I um, so I've started the Azul Conservation Program in Nicaragua um, three three four years ago now, um, and have done some various other projects there. Um, with sea turtle hatcheries, have a sea turtle program called Sea Turtle Rescue, um, and obviously starting this new program in the Azores. And regards to demand at those those centres, um, the demand for me has actually increased. With if you're if you think if if the question is about customer base, so the people who are now in the pandemic situation that I've found is a lot of people have started to question what either life is truly about or what they're doing. Uh, and so a lot of people are, and, and we have found one of the reasons why we're doing this webinar is a lot of people are starting to rethink what they wanna do with their life and time. And so um, I've had questions through the roof about when the programs are reopening, when can I come and go out? How can I help? What can I do this? And, and what's this new program gonna look like? So 
for me, the pandemic situation has made people a lot more reflective and maybe even more aware of what's going on in the world and how humans are impacting it. Uh, and therefore, I would say the situation has not necessarily decreased, but um, I feel like when if hopefully this pandemic situation ends, I feel there's a lot of people that's going to come out of it um, really sort of like full guns and blazing, wanting to get involved in conservation. And, and it's one of the reasons why one of our, our key points this last few months uh, has been trying to raise funds to open up new centres next year, because what we believe is that um, we might be inundated by people wanting to really try to start to make a difference, and especially those who are passionate about the marine world wanting to apply their uh, their time and energy into into something that they love so if you're asking about do i feel like the demand for actually people to get involved in conservation diving is decreasing i would actually say no um and especially those specializing in in restoration i think um we may see a lull now but i do feel that these types of programs are going to be something that will be in in, in great demand um, in the coming months. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, this pandemic has largely stopped the actions going on. Uh, the universities and, and the government groups have largely stopped what they're doing, but the problems have not gone away. So George is 100% correct there. And we've seen the biggest growth in our program over the last year. So the next question, um, also uh, Marco here, is he says that he recently read an article published last April on diversity in which it compares coral restoration effectiveness in four different areas of the world. And he'd like to ask you if the NHRCP and Rescapers work in the same way and if they had the same uh, approach towards coral restoration. So um, I am familiar with Reefscapers um, and this paper, actually this paper that he's referencing, if anyone's interested, um, you will search on Google Scholar for like the effectiveness of long-term coral restoration and look for the paper by Margot Hine from 2020. And it's a really great paper. Um, to me, it's one of the most uh, impactful papers in the coral restoration uh, industry that have come out in the last few years because it really highlights the problems. And alongside another um, paper that Margot did in 2019 with many other researchers from Australia that looked at, at coral restoration and they found that more than 80% of the coral restoration programs out there don't monitor for more than a year, um, which to me is just mind blowing that anyone could attempt to go into a, rest a uh, ecosystem that grows so slowly and not monitor their work for more than one year and claim success. So the Reefscaper programs is not one of those programs that is doing this and not monitoring or anything. They are a really wonderful program over there in the Maldives. And actually one of our interns, um, a, a, she, uh, Fan Colter, I think, uh, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, uh, a, a lo lovely French girl did her uh, internship at New Heaven and then went and started working with them over there. And so what they're doing at Reefscapers is using steel frame artificial reefs and transplanting coral fragments onto them. And mostly they are using um, what are called fragments of opportunity. So naturally occurring coral fragments that have been broken due to storms and fishes and other things. And they've had some great success. Um, I would say the biggest difference though between them and New Heaven, New Heaven also uses those steel frame structures. However, we do a lot of other things also. So in addition to using the steel frame structures, we're using mineral accretion devices, reef balls, concrete and glass, uh, bottle, what we call the bottle unit nurseries, um, sculptures, and, and all these large alternative dive sites. And we really try to take a more holistic approach to conservation and restoration. So we try to address all the factors on the reef with New Heaven. And I think that's the only way I've always set for almost 15 years that that's the only way to really make a difference. Um, and now that paper has really justified that way of thinking because in that paper that uh, Marco is referencing, New Heaven was the only program to show um, success in all six parameters assessed. And I think that Reefscapers was right on our tail. 
Um, so I think that Reefscapers is doing a wonderful job. And I think that they could improve it by maybe integrating some other techniques into the work that they're doing. Um, but I'm not going to try to tell them they have to do that because everybody's working with different resources and, and, and doing what they can. And so the Reefscapers, they're doing what they can and they're doing a great job of it. Um, but yeah, I would say the difference is that New Heaven is doing everything else. You know, we're doing the over there at New Heaven, they're doing the research side of it. They're removing coral predators. They're integrating with, you know, turtle nurseries, sharks and giant clams and all these other, you know, key species on the reef to ensure the sustainability of this ecosystem. Whereas reefscapers, like most of the other restoration programs out there, are focused on the foundation of the reefs, which is, of course, the corals. Cool. Um, so the next question we have, another good question from uh, Yuri here. Um, would a first step then be to follow conservation diver programs for so many weeks if, if he wants to change from being a, a designer to getting into what we're doing? Maybe, uh, George, do you want to take that one? Would you recommend if someone was uh, sure. doing something else and they wanted to be in conservation? How do they do that? Yeah, sure. yeah. I mean, the, the, the first step um, really is to understand, I, I mean, I've read, I can read your Stratultant, you're in designer work. So the first step I would do is start to understand how what you could bring to the table with your current skill set and um, you know what is it about you um, and the work you have done that may, will make you good in conservation and and start to have those conversations with people in conservation because you know it, when i first um sort of went out to this field i started getting to touch with various people and they told me okay this is good you should be utilizing this that and the other. um and once you kind of understand what it is you can bring to the marine conservation world i would say yes i mean unless you had previous experience in 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 practical application of, of marine science and, and conservation work and um, the first thing you really need to do is jump to a program because um one you need to know whether you really like that lifestyle and um, because um some people I, you know, they jump into it really quickly and they're realizing diving's tough. It's a long day. Um, you know, you aren't, you aren't just, um, you know, surveying a reef once a day. You'll get up six in the morning. You're sorting out the dive center. You're sorting students out. You've got teaching as well as doing the scientific work to do. So you're really trying to understand a whole new industry here. Um, and it isn't just scientific work you need to deal with, your relationship management, your customer management, you know, you're coming back at the end of the day and you are plugging in the data for hours and then you're dealing with social media and uploading photos and other things like that. So doing an internship at a program can really be very useful uh, to try and understand as a whole how the machine works. And once you start to understand that, you can then look at your previous experiences and see how you can help. And no one loves it more than having a volunteer on a program who says, hey, I, hey, I have loads of experience in marketing. Oh, I've got loads of experience with web design. Hey, you know, I can do this, that, and the other around, around the dive center. And then you start to show value. And in that value, you realize where you fit and can go forward in fitting in, in the conservation world. So my advice would be definitely get out there and get into, um, as many different programs you could possibly see and 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 do long-term internships as, as much as you can um and once you realize um where you fit you can then start to see the career path you want to take because um when you start to meet various and different people you see as as chad has sort of alluded to in, um, in early uh, the earlier part of this webinar that there's different people from all types of backgrounds and once you start making these contacts we are a huge network of, of people and everyone wants to help you and so once you start making those friendships it all becomes a lot easier i would only add to that you know right now like what george is saying you know if if money is a problem I would volunteer, um, find a place to volunteer. As I've found in my life, anytime I volunteer, I get back way more than I put in. It may not be money, um, but you know, and opportunities and, and, and friendships and, and all that. So you can always, if you can find somewhere around mm -hmm. you to volunteer, that's a great way to get your foot in the door. Yeah, I mean, I, it, comes, it comes into, a, I think, a question someone else has put about the cost of it. But as you're saying, 
if you can afford to volunteer, then definitely go and do it. But my other advice would be that if you're not a professional diver, get, go and get that qualification and, and get have an ability to earn income within the dive industry as well um, as a dive master at, at the first level, because at least if you're at a program as an intern, you can start working for free a little bit as well and you know and doing other things um to uh, to try and make the costs as low as possible for you but that could be another first step rather than going on a conservation program if you wanted your career then to try and get your professional dive status first might be a good idea definitely so the next question we got here uh, another great question from yuri he says can you guys describe a typical day in the life of a conservation diver and so, of course, this is going to be a bit different depending on which program you're at. And, you know, if you're at one of our programs, even between different countries is going to be different. If you go to a different company, it's going to be very different. Um, but basically, as George kind of outlined, we have long days. Um, my day, you know, it would be typically we wake up, we start to get the materials ready, and then we'll do the lectures and the, the knowledge development in the morning. Um, so we'll go through in probably like an hour, two hours, sometimes more of skill development and at that time the interns will be preparing for the dive getting all of the slates ready to collect data everything like that um, once that's done we usually have a quick lunch and then we head out to the dive we'll spend a very long time underwater we're not doing 50 minute dives we're doing you know some times our dives are like two hours long because we spend the whole dive at five meters and so we're we're you know down there a long time finish up with the dive it may be collecting research it might be um, doing some protection and restoration work come back then we've got the debriefing and, and the data entry um, and then we usually do some more knowledge development um, looking at you know maybe what species did we find new on the reef um, working on papers it's generally long days and um, we also tend to work seven days a week um, but i would say it's not really work you know <laughs> Um, if you're doing what you love, then you never work a day in your life. Um, I worked seven days a week, 12 hour days for um, 15 years and never once did I feel like I was really working hard. Um, you know, it's a lot of being with friends and scuba diving and, and getting home at the end of the day and feeling really like it was a rewarding day, like you really accomplished something, you, you know, planted 500 corals and, and you know did all these different things put down a new artificial reef every day is so rewarding and, and exciting and you're with people who are just wonderful everybody that's around you is there because they want to do what you they have the same interests as you they want to do what you're doing i i never felt that i worked the whole like a day really hard you know and even though some days i got at the end of the day i couldn't even walk i was so tired it just it felt so good to do it Um, so yeah, I see we got another question from Anne here, and she says that I see many volunteering programs and internships of conservation diving. However, and they're often very expensive. And yes, this is a problem. How do you get into it as a paid employment? You want to take that one, George? Or? Sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, with it, with regards to the cost of these programs, I mean, I can only speak to with regards to how typically we cost our programs and um i think the the, the way that we do it at, at all the centers is the first initial month can, it is expensive because it covers a lot of the costs to keep the program um running and going um but then the latter months we always do it at a, at a quite a big discount almost at cost and often after the third month at a loss and then we've even had interns that we kept on for six months paying nothing so they may look daunting in the first month uh, as, a, as an outlay um, but you show your worth and and you really get in and show that you know you're you're providing that program with with the benefits of you being there then the the, the price does go down quite a lot and as i've said you know and and, and as chad being at new heaven many people stayed post four or five months and were weren't paid were paying nothing so it may look daunting in the first instance the cost but do realize that uh, many of these programs are just looking for good people to come and help them and if you show that you are a great person and person they want on their team then the cost goes down 
and and as I said, uh, down to to zero cost in in many cases that we've had. Now, so therefore, your question is, how do you then get into paid employment? It's exactly that, really. I mean, it, it's showing the internship that you're on that, that that having you is actually a great addition to the team. Um, the way we work at Conservation Diver is, is once you've completed the, the internship program, um, you can then ask to start to train to be an instructor should you fit the requirements and you know the, the instructors at that program um, believe that you're going to be a good instructor and, and a good member of our team, then you start to train to, to teach and once you start to train to teach, um, uh, it, at least in our business setup, uh, you can then either work at the program if, if possible, or uh, the way we are set up, we help our individuals go off and start programs of their own. And, and that's really where the best way to get paid employment is. And the whole reason Chad started Conservation Diver was to help people like me realize that um, I didn't have to be on my own in the world to try and start a program and, and try and do this. You know, I can have a creative community around myself um, through um, being part of an organization like uh, Conservation Diver and other programs I'm sure around the world are, do, are doing similar things to support their interns to, to get on and, and start their own uh, permanent program. So, it's not about being employed. I wouldn't jump into this to say, okay, I'm gonna to go to this um, conservation program on the hope that they will employ me because the reality of that is probably quite low. But if you go out there to get as, get trained up and, and, and to become as good as an instructor as you're, you're hopefully being taught by, then you will be equipped with all the necessary um, skill sets to go and start something like this on your own. And, and this is why we exist as we are and why we do things like this, so we can help people to do this. And it's one of the reasons why we're, we're launching um, uh, on Patreon in the, in the next week or so to start offering mentorships to people that have got the experience and now want to start to get paid and have a career in this industry. Um, so through, through through the skill sets you can you can gain from training, you can then find employment by essentially starting your own program, and and you know that's what we hope to be be supporting everyone to try and do. Um, but the initial expense, it is something that you're going to have to um, unfortunately you know save up for. But um, as uh, as many of us had, had did do, and 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 also the addition of working in the divers industry, I think I was a full time instructor uh, as well as at, at New Heaven when I was there. I think I was doing an open water course and then going back to, to, to teach and work at the New Heaven program and then having to do a day here because I had no cash or whatever. It, you know, the reality is you're, you're, it's a struggle, but you're in the struggle as you love what you're doing. Um, and I think many of the interns that we have get jobs in the bar and, and, and when they can eventually start teaching is when they have the ability to start making a career out of it. And then it's up to you really in the sense that, you know, you're the one who's got to go out and, and, and start a program of your own. Um, but hopefully with, with, with organizations like ourselves, we can help you do that. Yeah, definitely. The only thing I would add is, you know, being the, the head of one of these programs for so long, everybody I hired was someone who made themselves so valuable, I couldn't let them leave, you know, and, and I had to keep them. So make yourself valuable. Um, the next question we have is from Clara. And Clara asks, what level of study would be required to pursue a marine conservation career? And um, would you say that a master's degree in marine biology is the absolute minimum to get a career in marine conservation? I would say a master's degree in marine biology or ecology would be a great ticket into this career, but not necessary, um, the only way. I, when I started the New Heaven Reef Conservation Program, I had a bachelor's degree in environmental sciences. Um, and I, as my honors thesis, I wrote the business plan for New Heaven Reef Conservation. And I got my honors done. And then I said, well, why don't I actually try to make this work? And uh, went back to Thailand. And, and that's the only degree I had. And um, that program is still running today, all these years later, 13 or 14 years later. So if you have that marine biology master's degree or anything, that's going to be a great ticket to get you where you want to go. But if you don't have it and you can't get it, don't feel limited. Um, don't feel like, oh, well, I don't have this degree, so I've got to 
do some boring job and, and go work in an office and shovel paper around for eight hours a day. No, I mean, if, if this is what you want to do, find a way to get your foot in the door and, and start, you know, opening up doors to yourself and then going through them and, and just make this happen. Um, I, I wouldn't let that limit you at all. Um, but the more degrees you have, of course, the more employable you will be, the more opportunities will be open to you and the easier this will all be. Um, so yeah, it's, you know, it, it's kind of, if you have it, great. If you don't have it, you can still, you can still do what you want to do. Yeah, and I would, one example I would probably add to that is probably the complete polar opposite of what you're, what you're asking is, where one of the two of the best interns that I worked with at New Heaven were uh, Elle Haskin, who's now on the board, and another one called Chloe Wilms. Um, Elle, bachelor's in marine biology, now studying her master's. Chloe left school, uh, left high school, left at high school, um, and pretty much came out to New Heaven and started to intern and, and learn as much as she could, she could possibly could. Um, and she became a great advocate of the University of Life and, and really putting in the effort and, and time to really learn everything. And, and what made Chloe, and I do really stand by this a lot of the time, is one of the best instructors I've ever seen at Conservation Diver, was just her humility and her ability just to connect on a personal level so beautifully with every single student she worked with. And it was, it was amazing. She, she had a huge knowledge base, but when she didn't know something, she would get excited to learn it with that student. And it, it, it wasn't a, a knowledge gap you felt when students didn't know a question with her. It was like an exciting adventure that then she could go on with, with that student. So um, it's one of those examples I like to bring up to people because they get wrapped up in this you must be, you know, a marine biologist and have these degree levels to, to teach them this stuff. And I, I say Chloe and Elle started and did the internship at the same time and both them blossomed into the two best, well, two best instructors that we had. Um, and Chloe was high school and Elle is pursuing academics and, and in the conservation dire environment and around the conservation centre, you wouldn't know. No one would know. They would lay, they wouldn't even question uh, whether there was differences in their two academic abilities, because you know Chloe was such an amazing instructor, and she had all what was necessary to teach this material and show real love and compassion for for the marine world. So that that example I like to always say to people because it really just hopefully hits home um, the the varying levels of study you really need to just show show that you care and want to save um, um, the oceans as much as possible because that's why we do this. Um, so hopefully that adds a little bit of flavor to the answer too. Yeah, and <laughs> it's great to hear you talk about how fortunate we have to be surrounded by so many wonderful people, which is a good lead yeah. into um, Anthony's question because Anthony is talking about uh, the fact that he was able to get over to Leon's program, another one of our wonderful people that we have on our team and got to meet Spencer, one of, again, our loveliest people on our team. Um, so he asks, um, is what is the best next step to get hands-on experience since he's already done one of the uh, student level programs? Well, in our programs uh, with Conservation Diver, kind of the logical next step would really be an internship. Um, so if you've already done some of the student level co courses, and you like them and you're interested in them, then try to get into an internship um, as soon as you're able to travel again. Um, that would be my advice. The internship, um, it's a little bit more money, as George mentioned, but again, you're, we can't know who's good and who's not by an email. So we have to tell everybody a, a large price because we're going to get some people who are going to come and not be very helpful for us. And so having them pay, then keeps our program going. Other people come and they're very helpful and we don't want them to have to leave because they don't have enough money. And so, um, you know, we will work with you if it's our program. And all the other programs I know that are out there are the same way. Um, if you're doing a good job, they'll keep you around. And so I would say, look around you if you don't have a lot of money to travel to one of our programs look around yourself and see what programs are in your area or available to you and just try to get involved in some volunteering or internship opportunities and really start to get your training and experience so that you can add that to your resume and make yourself 
um, an attractive candidate for an employment or future opportunity. Cool. Do you have anything to add to that or should I go to the next one, George? No, I think I, th I think it's better you've answered that perfectly. I mean, it, yeah, you try and try and pursue the the internship, and then look to see whether you can, um, you know, pursue a career as a, as an instructor or or, or anything of, or along that route. So, yeah, yeah, and I just remembered, um, you know, we also a lot of programs like us at the moment have a lot of online stuff going on. Um, you know, assessing existing data and going through old photos and, and helping out with stuff. So if you're bored at home and you want something to do, um, check around online because a lot of people, a lot of researchers who are normally in the field collecting data are now sitting around analyzing it and can use some help. So the next question. And to, 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 to add to that, because Chad is quite humble, um, he is doing a mineral accretion um, or mineral accretion technology talk quite soon and he won't he won't plug it because he's too humble like that but if you want to if you want to learn some cool stuff about um, mineral accretion technology that would be a definite one to to jump on I'm going to jump on it too so <laughs> <laughs> cool um, so the next one we have uh, again a great question from Marco and Marco's asking about specifically about the Thailand program on Koh Tao and about traveling. Um, unfortunately, I, anything that I say about the current rules and, and about traveling will be different by the time you get your airline ticket. Um, Thailand was opening back up. They had opened up to special tourists and were requiring a bit of a quarantine and, and requiring that you get two COVID tests. However, right now, Thailand is spiking. I think yesterday they had over more than 10,000 cases, um, which is, they've had like a handful of cases since this all started. So it's, it's really hard for us to say. I, I apologize. I can't really answer that question accurately. Um, I would say just, you know, we all, like all of us, just keep your head in the news and keep checking. If Thailand is where you want to go, I might recommend that you, one, contact with the New Heaven program because they'll be able to give you much more accurate, up-to-date information than I will. Um, you can contact Kirsty at conservationdiver.com, send her an email. Um, the other thing you can do is join up on thaivisa.com, which is a forum that always is going to be the most up-to-date place to get information about visas and travel. Um, the next one we have is from Amanda. and. Um, this one is relevant to what George is mentioning. Um, any, she just became a dive master and she wants to know if there's any advice on the next steps for work. So is this, I'm assuming this is work in the conservation industry and, and having, having your dive masters, I mean, I think someone asked this in the Instagram um, chat we did uh, earlier today or later today depending on where you are in the world um, we ask um, for the in for people to have their dive masters to work in our programs essentially because it just sets that level of competency under the water and then your ability to manage issues um, with regards to getting your instructor level status if I uh, assume that's what you're asking um, it's, it's, it can be of very importance depending on your own ability and confidence to teach, I would say. Um, if you're outgoing and, and, and you understand the, the safety precautions around diving and how, how to control those with students and you feel that, you know, hey, I, I also quite outgoing and I also feel I could teach a group of eight people, a group of 10, command a, a room of 20 students that I'm talking to, then you know what you don't necessarily need to pay all the money to Paddy to learn how to do their instructor course, because it is only two weeks. And in my opinion, not really worth the paper it's on because you do more in your dive masters. So look at yourself and, uh, and understand, okay, what, may, what will I get out of a program like that? Will it be someone teaching me different styles and control underwater? Because, you know, you do get a bit out of it from doing that program, uh, that IDC or whatever they call it. Um, but essentially it could just be a waste of money. The only other benefit I'd say with doing it is having your instructor makes you a lot more employable at a dive center should you wish to go out and start your own program. So for instance, when I went out to Nicaragua for the first time, 
um, to set up the Conservation Diver Programme. The fact that I was already a, a PADI instructor meant that I could work full time at the dive centre whilst setting everything up. And so therefore I could survive and get in lays and work with the relationships in the dive centre. And, and it gave me, you know, kudos amongst the other divers because, hey, you're an instructor and, and the guy was coming from somewhere. I've been an instructor in a fair few uh, different places and so, and a dive master, so had experience of the dive industry to teach people there. But is it important to get involved in something like Conservation Diver? I, I would say no. I wouldn't say yes, sorry. Um, but it, it, depending on your own situations, it may be something you want to explore um, just to try and support yourself and get you that extra sort of teaching experience if you need it. Yeah. Um, the only, anything to add there, Chad? Yeah, the only thing I would kind of add is like again about you know just kind of expanding your horizons and not you know look getting that kind of tunnel vision and thinking that you have to go down the the beaten path um I, I would say you know there's a lot of paths to take as well a lot of people you know find different ways like like for example photography you know if you're a dive master and you're also good at taking pictures really start to develop those skills and maybe you can make some money on the side taking pictures uh, maybe you could make some money on the side during your dive master, adding little things to your dive master, your fun dives, like doing a coral watch survey or a green fin survey. Um, you know, these different things that are free and available to you that really add value to you being a dive master and make you stand out from the crowd. Um, you know, there's like on Kotal, we have now like over 70 dive schools. And so if you have a dive master, it is meaningless. Um, you won't be able to get a job there just because you're a dive master. You better speak three languages or be good at photography or have something else to offer than just saying, hey, I just finished my dive master. Because at least on a place like Kotal where the market's so saturated, you won't be able to get a job um, with just that. Um, so really expand your horizons. And again, like I keep, I keep coming back to it, but if you're good at something, keep doing that and hone those skills in to become the best at that skill, whatever that skill is be the best at it because you'll find a way to integrate that skill into what you love. Um, the next program and the next question we have here, another good question from Yuri. I think this is a good one for, for me to answer, but George, you can also uh, pipe in here. The, it says about that bridging year, what are the approximate costs of living? And he asked about to specifically use the example of Anko Tao. Um, and I think that this is good because we have a whole wide range. Um, my experience to tell my story when i went to kotao i had 500 dollars in my pocket um i was you know basically homeless um, and i ended up staying there for 10 years um so you can do it on a budget um i ended up just volunteering and through volunteering i was able to get my open water advanced and dive master i didn't pay for any of that but I was just volunteering and being like, hey, what can I do to help people? Because I'm on this island with no job and nothing to do. And I'm not someone who just wants to sit on the beach all day. And I started volunteering. And then people were like, hey, if you're going to be around here, you want to do your open water? Hey, you want to do your, your advanced course? You want to do your rescue? You want to do your, your dive master? Because people just wanted me to be around because I was helpful. Um, so I was able to get it very cheap. Uh, $500 lasted me 10 years, basically. Um, but other people, you know, shouldn't necessarily rely on that. Um, if you're going to come in, you know, you'll have the, the posted costs that you can see on the New Heaven Dive site, the New Heaven Conservation Programs website. Um, but then for food, um, I would say, you know, probably budget around two to 300 baht per day, which is about 10 US dollars for food. Um, accommodation, another $300 a month, probably. We do have accommodation partners. New Heaven is a um, luxury resort, so you probably wouldn't stay there if you're looking to stay long-term on a budget. But we have programs like, if you wanna search Facebook, you can search for Gaia. Gaia is a wonderful place to stay. Um, it's, it's run by a wonderful woman who has done our programs and she, she did our program, our student course, and decided that she wanted to be a part of it. So she moved to the island and opened up a resort so that she could be a, a partner with us. Um, she believes in it and she's environmentally concerned. She's a wonderful person. So you can contact Gaia um, if you want to find a place to stay. The one thing I would warn about is to have some extra money 
Um, the one thing I see is students come, I tell them the budget they need, and then they show up and they like to drink alcohol. Um, one beer is on an island in Thailand is the same as one meal. So if you go out every night and you're drinking three or four beers, you're going to blow through your food money really quick and end up going home early with empty pockets. Um, so, you know, those are the base things. But if, if you're someone, you know, who has other costs that you need to worry about on top of that, then you, your money might go much quicker. Would you agree with that, George? All that info? <laughs> Yeah, I definitely think I've fallen into the trap of spending too much money on beer when I first went out. Um, so, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it, 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 you know, the, the budget from from my experience is, you know, around for rent, you're talking, talking from two to three hundred a month, probably for a cheap accommodation in some of the different places I've I, I've been living at. Uh, as Chad said, food is is most in most places the cheapest place, uh, the piece, cheapest thing to or the thing to save on. Um, for instance, in Nicaragua, I would have rice and beans quite a lot of the meals uh, of, of the day, which is really cheap, and I make a big pot in the morning, and then you know have it have. And I think most interns at New Heaven was survive on that fried rice up the road for like 30 baht or whatever it is um you know so saving on those food food sharing houses with people having accommodation with a kitchen in, in thailand there's no point having a kitchen because food's cheaper to eat out than to cook most of the time but depending on where you are having a kitchen can help um and then trying to what i i, I hosted um quiz nights and karaoke nights in my evening which gave me free food and um free out al free alcohol the night i hosted so i treated those two of my not as my nights out and so i did things like this and so it's it's about trying to, to you know be inventive with your with your sort of time out there and then try and see where you can save and 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 be most cost effective but with an over overall figure i think you know about 500 dollars a month you could survive um and get and get away with um you know with basic food rations and maybe a, a, a night out now and then um but with, with all of these things and it's, it's also nice to get out in the community to to get a little side job to work in the evenings um it, it's nice it, you get to talk to different people you get to talk to the tourists you get to talk to various people in the industries as well so there, there's a little bit of a budget i can give you but it's kind of hard um per location um and um, what you need to do um so yeah that's all i'd add yeah and this this might be a bit of a tangent um but just you know uh, the world is always evolving um uh, just to mention it um like for example right now a lot of people are doing a lot of online work um freelancing micro tasks these types of works and those you can do from anywhere in the world and so if this is something that you think you want to get into maybe now during the quarantine is a good time to start learning how you can become a digital nomad and start working online and then if you do end up when you know travel is a thing again um, you'll be able to work from anywhere in the world um, in your spare time and so maybe check out some websites like upwork and fiverr and and you know amazon turks mechanical turks and these types of websites where you can actually start working online right now and then continue that later um so another one that we got here um this will take both me and george to answer i think it's a good question from ann and she's saying that if we could do some name dropping of some good programs that do conservation diary so uh, of course we love our own program um but there are a lot of really <laughs> great programs out there um i would like to highlight the ones that i think are the best um that i have you know kind of partnerships with one of them that, that really stands out from the crowd in my mind is Reef Check Malaysia. Now, Reef Check is a global program. And so, you know, they are all over the place and each center is independently owned and operated. So I am not necessarily endorsing every Reef Check center. However, the one in Malaysia is run by Alvin and Sue, who are incredible people. They are so wonderful, so dedicated, and they work so incredibly hard. They've also come up and done some training with us. And so a lot of the techniques that we use, they also utilize. If, if you end up there, it's a wonderful program. Um, Reefscapers, we've already mentioned, is another great program. Um, 
Portal Watch is a program that you can get involved in no matter where you are in the world. Um, you can do that. Other citizen science programs like iSeahorse, iNaturalist, um, these are good programs that you can get involved in for free. Um, you can learn, you can start taking data and helping them out. Um, we also have some partners. Oh, I've just in, um, I'm having, if you search out, it's, it's in Honduras. There's a really great guy. He's an American guy. His name's Trip, and he does work down in Honduras with, you know, coral nurseries and anything. He's doing a really great job down there. Um, I would check out the coral gardeners. They're also starting to do some work with mineral accretion devices. And I don't know much about them, but I've seen on their website the, the mineral accretion device work they're doing it is really wonderful. And there's not many people doing that. So that's really unique. Um, the only people I know other than us doing mineral accretion work is coral aid and, and reef scapers. So that's you know, somewhere you can really get in. Um, George, what do you think? You probably know better than I do even. Yeah, I'm putting me on the spot here. I mean, yeah, I mean, the, 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 one I, the, the one I'm most impressed with recently and the reason why we're hopefully going to partner with them is, is Marine Research and Conservation Institute in Madagascar. Um, we, their program looks extremely solid. They have great inlays into the community, into the scientific community of Madagascar, and as well as the government. Uh, great grounding uh, to be a really good program and hopefully through some of the collaboration collaborative work that we're planning to do with them i feel like that program is going to really have um a great presence um in the market um with regards to that in in central and south america um there is as chad mentioned i think it's roatan I forget the name of it too, but I, uh, I, th there's a couple of good programs on Utila that we can uh, um, sort of send you the details of afterwards. Um, there's, yeah, I'm on the spot and I can't think, but let's let's put a, we can put a list together and maybe send it to you, Anne, because I mean, I'm also trying to think like so they're merging in my head, thinking like I can't remember whether I like that person or not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to say say something and be misquoted, um, but let, if if a list of uh, sort of uh, endorsed centres is something that everyone is looking for, um, then at the end of this call we can sort of put a, a, a an email out to all of our team and maybe just give a, a sort of a top ten um, centres to everyone so that they can they can explore in their own time before. Um, and also probably gives us some time to bait <laughs> what we know about the, the different programs. Yeah, um, the only other one I would so, add is uh, Reef Watch India is a really great program. Um, it's not associated with Reef Check. Um, it's, it's its own pro independent program. And the girl who runs that program is incredibly dedicated, doing just wonderful work. Um, also, ATMEC, A-T-M-E-C, um, is a program that is kind of work they, they are a partner with us the 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 owner of that program raul mayortra has been integral to new heaven and conservation divers development um, and he's now started his own program they do a couple of our our courses but mostly they're doing their own thing um, they're more into the science side of it so that's two others i i would definitely recommend checking out Um, so this is a question, I don't know if you can see it, George, but uh, Francisco is asking you specifically, has mm -hmm. Azul Conservation yeah. ever collaborated with Peace Corps volunteers? They're interested in marine science education, um, community development, and create marine climate change. So I'm, I'm, I'm not from the US and I don't really know too much about the Peace Corps, but from what my understanding is, uh, there are groups within Nicaragua that do work within the Peace Corps. Whether Conservation Diver has collaborated with these or not, um, Nicaragua is a bit of a complicated place, and I wouldn't. And the area in which Azul Conservation is in, um, I don't believe there's much Peace Corps activity. Um, 
However, all of the points that you mentioned about marine science education, community engagement, empowerment is exactly what we're trying to do there. Um, we are, well, we signed a sort of a contract with the university groups of Biku uh, along the, uh, the Caribbean coast within Nicaragua uh, that I would specifically help them develop their marine science program um, alongside uh, the team at Conservation Diver and even, you know, teach our courses as part of their university degrees to try and give their their students a little bit more um, flavor of what it would be to dive, for instance, and see corals and, and understand what it would be to, to, to get into a career like this. Um, and also everything we're doing at that program is to empower the, the local community. We, we're working with the, the, a, a group called Blue Energy that are, that are managing coastal resources, doing great work with mangroves and lobster fisheries and other things like that. So I wouldn't say I'm that familiar with the Peace Corps and their and their volunteers. I know it is a, a thing, but it's it's not necessarily something I've come across, nor it'd be something that I would turn away. And if it, if it did come across my uh, my table, then it would be something I'd look at. But all those things you listed is exactly what the program is trying to achieve, but not necessarily through the formalities of Peace Corps. Um, maybe Chad has, uh, knows a little bit more about Peace Corps than I do. Yeah, I... Uh, I wanted to be in the Peace Corps when I was very young, um, so I, I looked into it, but it was probably like 20, 25 years ago, um, so I'm not too sure, but I would just say that Conservation Diver, um, if people share our ethos and, and they have similar ideas about how a marine world should be um, taken care of, then we were happy to work with them, and everything you've mentioned there is all positive stuff that is right in line with what we do. So we'd love to talk with you more about that in the future, maybe. Um, the next yeah. question we have, another great question from Yuri here. He's asking, um, he says that he mentioned another one of the beautiful souls that we are fortunate enough to work with, uh, Tony, one of our photographers. And he's asking about getting visas. Um, so yeah, it, Conservation Diver, you know, we are the umbrella organization. We're operating all over the world. And so it's very hard for us to maybe tell you exactly what you need to do about visas for particular countries. So you'd want to contact the actual program. Um, so if you're interested in about visas in Thailand, then you would want to contact again with um, New Heaven. And you can email Kirsty at conservationdiver.com about that. Um, I would say, you know, the visa laws are always changing. We can sometimes help with um, volunteer visas or education visas, writing um, letters. But um, with Thailand specifically, the education visa requires that it is a established government institution. So it'd have to be a university. Um, so with Thailand, we can't. Other countries, we kind of can. Um, so it's really a case by case basis. Um, but if you are going to Thailand, um, generally, we would recommend you just go ahead and get the tourist visa because that's the easiest one for Thailand specifically. Other countries will be different, so you'll have to just kind of contact our people when you're ready to go to those. Um, the next question here, a uh, good question from Trevor, uh, one, one of our big online fans here, help join in on all the workshops. We really appreciate you, Trevor. Um, he says he has a degree in passion, um, so he likes hearing all this. Sorry. Uh, I think so the question is, what's your oldest ever intern? <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, George. Um, so this will be different between the programs. I think our oldest intern, well, we've had a lot of them. I mean, Maria, she was quite old. And I don't mean to say she's quite old. She's older than the general students that we have. She's, she's young. Um, she might be in, in her 40s or 50s. She did an amazing job we had when I was Earlier, we've, we've had people in their 60s um, do the internship, probably like four or five of them who are in their 60s, and they have done a wonderful job. These are generally people who are retired, and they've been diving for a long time, and they want to give something back. They want to use their you know, retirement all this time they have diving. They don't want to necessarily just spend it fun diving, and they want to spend it doing something valuable and give back to this ecosystem that they've enjoyed for so long. And some of these interns that we've had that are 60 plus are some of the best interns that we've had. Um, and so we don't have like an age limit per se. Um, if you can, 
carry your equipment down the beach to the water and do an hour and a half or two hour dive with us, then we'd love to have you. Uh, I, George, did you uh, have anything different to say on that? No, I, I, I completely, I think yeah, the internships and the, the age difference of students is it can be quite large. Um, even when I was interning at, um, at, at New Heaven, you know, yes, there are 18 year old interns. Yes, there are 30, 40, 50 year old interns. And it's about um, the dynamic that is created amongst those interns that creates a good program. And, and it's why we have instructors like um, Kirsty, who manages interns, the internship program, who really starts to challenge different people in different ways because different interns are going to have different needs and different requirements from the program. And some of the other interns um, may have more mobility issues and so want to get more involved in data um, and some of the interns don't want to sit afterwards and do data they'd rather get nine and carry all the tanks down because it's a workout you know so managing um, the interns uh, at a program is one of our difficult tasks but it's one of the, the fun things that we get to do and 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 we definitely encourage people of all walks backgrounds demographics and and um, what have you to come because um, it doesn't matter how old you are as long as you want to, to, to conserve the oceans like we do and, and we will work out a way and at least that's our ethos and what I felt from all the all of our team that work at Conservation Divers that it, age, is, age shouldn't be the, the barrier it's, it's maybe only what your own, your own body is telling you you know. <laughs> yeah and I would also go on to say you know we've had some you know researchers that have come around at, at New Heaven specifically I can recall several people who were in their 70s or 80s who were traveling around and, and, and saw what we were doing and were like hey I'll come and, and join you guys for some dives and then give you a lecture like to your team and talk about what I did in my career mm -hmm. and that was like for yeah. us every even the instructors were sitting there like wide-eyed the whole time like this is an amazing opportunity to learn from someone who is done incredible things in their life so yeah there's a lot of value to that and yeah. so this next question i think there's 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 also the uh, the older the older generation that come to, that have come to the programs that essentially don't do the internship they just enjoy the dives you know and they don't necessarily get muck in with the actual internship role but they say hey i'm here for four weeks of conservation diving i'm going to get involved and they they go to the lectures and they turn up and go on the diving and it's not necessarily an internship but you know we allow them to 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 use it as a, you know a fun holiday or a fun fun time to 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 learn some of this stuff as well just for their own passion so um the age thing doesn't matter it just is about what what you want to want to get out of the program i think is is most important absolutely i think this next question sounds like it's for you as well george um it's from i hope i say this right yes. um and she here she's asking if you're starting any program in the mediterranean yes yeah, so we have also spoken about the azores program so for those who aren't aware on the call, we are, are where I am right now is in the Azores, um, bang in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, Nine Island Archipelago. Um, we are launching here in three or four months. Um, and the main focus of the work we're doing here with Conservation Diver is we'll be doing um, new whale conservation courses. These are going to be non-diving courses um, um, and they will be from two days uh, and then a two week plus course, uh, all learning about how to work as a researcher within um, the, um, where, within, with, with small citations and, and the great whales. And basically um, using photo ID, hydrophones and other sort of equipment to monitor groups uh, and ID different types of, uh, uh, of whales within the area. We are also going to be redesigning our EMP course to suit the Atlantic Oceans and other oceans where it's not as cool, calm and collective to lay down a lovely little transect and swim and count uh, what you see. Um, and so this is something that I think me and Chad might even have a meeting in a week um, about trying to get this sorted. Um, so we are in the process of adapting um, the EMP course to sort of more strenuous water. Um, and this is exactly the sort of thing that we would then want to take um, to the Mediterranean. 
Um, it is one of the ideas and next steps that I would like to do after the Azores. Um, once we have launched everything in the Azores, I have another contact with a friend here who has a dive centre in the Algarve, um, not quite in the Mediterranean yet, uh, but as a uh, closer step into, uh, into that sea. Um, but we, my, my ambition would be to, to try and start a programme up soon within the Mediterranean. And the, my honest opinion in, in that is that uh, with COVID and the world that we live in right now, um, I got a lot of demand for people wanting to come to the Azores and I had to kind of explain to them uh, the, the majority of the program in the Azores is going to be about whale conservation. We are going to be doing these EMP courses and we may apply our seahorse ecology and nudibranch ecology courses to the region. Um, but the, re the whole reason we came here is to start to work um, um, with whales. Um, and do courses within this field. So we are going to do some diving courses uh, here, um, but that's what the main emphasis of the Azores. Now, my point really is that I had a lot of Europeans saying, okay, look, I can stay in Europe and I want to do conservation, what's possible? So on the back of that question that's been fired at me a lot, my thought was, hey, we need to be in the Mediterranean somewhere, exactly what you're asking. So I am looking for that that partner, that, that dive center um, that we could possibly pair with and would hope to either go myself or I'm also here with one of our other great instructors, Joel, um, who I've also talked to personally about potentially starting that relationship in the Mediterranean later this summer, if we can find a partner that um, fits the requirements. So it is definitely something we want to do because I think a lot of Europeans would well like to still be able to get involved um, with this work uh, whilst they're maybe confined to the continent. So um, yes is the answer. Um, when, how and who will be um, something hopefully we'll be able to divulge in the coming months. Yeah, and just to add to that, you know, we do, um, as, as we get more money coming in, like fundraising, we do offer scholarships sometimes um, for students who want to open programs in their region, in their local area, if there isn't one there already. Um, so, you know, maybe keep an eye out of that in the future, if that maybe if, if you're living in the Mediterranean and you think you'd be a good person to open up a program there, um, we do help you with that and we have that opportunity to do so. Um, so the next question we got here, uh, another great question from Yuri is asking about any online courses that teach you a bit about the fundamentals of marine biology. So for me, I would say the first great resource that's completely free is YouTube. Um, if you go on there and maybe search for like, um, for example, MIT, um, they put all of their courses, like their lectures, they videotape a lot of the, the professor's lectures and they're on YouTube for free. Um, this summer I went through and did an, an um, what was it, evolutionary ecology course from MIT. Um, all of like 30 lectures that were involved, I just put on YouTube when I was doing other stuff and I listened to all these lectures. So I took a free college course in, in, in that. Um, and so I would say definitely go to YouTube. There's also some paid programs. I can't say whether they're good or not because I haven't tried them, but I've seen them around. Um, and so there's some that are pretty cheap. You can get them for like 35 to $40. Um, and then there's the more expensive ones where you would actually get like a certificate or some kind of, you know, um, something to show that you've completed. I don't think it's like a diploma or anything, but something to show that you've done the course. Um, but for me, I would say, you know, I, I'm always looking for places to not spend money. Um, so I would say YouTube um, is a great place to go. There's so much on there. We also offer our online workshops. Um, we, we, we did a bunch earlier, as uh, Trevor can attest to, I think he came to most of them. Um, but we kind of slowed down because people, you know, there wasn't as much interest, I think, as, as quarantine wore on, people found other things to do. Um, but we're all, we're all working from home and we love doing those online workshops. So if we have interest to do one, then we're happy to do one. So if you kind of go through our courses on our website and, and you see one that's incredibly interesting, um, write us an email. And, and if, if we have a couple of people that are interested, We'll, we'll do an online course. Um, you know, that's something that, that we enjoy doing and something that keeps us involved and our, our brains quick on the topic and everything. 
Um, so, so yeah, definitely let us know. Some of those do, we do require some money, um, but others we don't. And if people are, you know, helping us out, then we make those free to them. All of anyone who does any volunteering for us right now, we have interns that are helping us with marketing, fundraising and all this stuff. We let them into all those for free. Um, it, it, you know, there's ways to make it free. Um, and if it does cost money, it doesn't cost a lot. Yeah. Do you have anything to add to that, George? Any other resources that I'm not thinking of? Um, yeah, I mean, you can explore the route I did and got in touch with universities. Quite a few universities offer some evening courses, instant learning courses in marine biology fundamentals. Uh, Exeter University, for instance, there's the one I, I sort of uh, worked through. Um, and they were actually good enough to, you know, with, with I think that it, you don't actually have to pay for that course, but you got assigned a tutor who could you know, answer your specific questions. Um, I found it really useful to apply the degree I had to marine biology because I already had knowledge of, you know, regression models and STATA and R and all those other programs. And so it was about how do I apply it to science now? And so if you, you can, I would have a look at the universities near you. Uh, they may actually have small programs like this. Um, and as Chad said, I do, I do think one of the things that we do well here is is, is people ask, send us, a, send us an Instagram post or an email and say, hey, I really want to learn about this and we'll do a chat on it and and you know it's and it's some of them do cost so it's like 20 bucks but it's it's you know it's it's well worth the time to 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 tune into those sessions um and i think the only the other thing i would add is to join facebook groups like marine biology org and cetal fauna and stuff like this uh, groups um that have marine biologists in them because often they post um about webinars and presentations that are going on that you can join um, i think there's one with the american cetacean society on the 31st of um january and stuff like that so i found out by about those by being in these in these groups so as Chad said, it's best to save money as you can, especially if you're going to jump into this world um, 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 uh, and, just, and uh, incurring the costs of trying to do so. So um, if we can find any other programs, uh, so if we can find any other uh, courses that we think are really worthwhile, we'll definitely post about those, I think. But yeah. And, yeah. and also Trevor's reminded us a uh, really great site is Wise Oceans. So you can Google them. Um, thanks for that, Trevor. And also, um, I would recommend learning how to use SciHub. <laughs> I would say, you know, everything that you need to learn is already on the internet. Um, so scientific papers are a little bit daunting for some people. Um, but once you start getting into them, it's like anything, it gets easier, the more you do it. Um, so if you go start using Google Scholar, and, and you're finding papers, and you don't have access to them, um, go ahead and learn how to use Sci-Hub so you can get access to basically any paper that you need if you're not associated with a university or something. All right. So I, I see we don't have any other questions for the moment. Unless I've got, any... we've got one. Okay. Do you have a plan to make event in Cox Bazaar too? Oh. Um, I, I believe... Cox Bazaar is Bangladesh, I believe. Um, um, with regards to Bangladesh, I mean, I, I have been there um, and I did ask the question about marine conservation when I was there because I had a friend working in forest conservation. Um, and as far as I was aware, there wasn't diving opportunities in Cox Bazaar, um, or at least from what I understood, um, not necessarily good diving conditions. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I didn't believe that was something that was possible in that region. Um, but I mean, with regards to that whole area, the most possible place for something like conservation diver to work would be maybe somewhere like the Andamans um, or the coast on the Western coast of India or something like this. Um, the likelihood of us coming to do an event in Cox Bazaar is quite low, uh, unless there was some sort of sponsorship to, to have one of our team fly to, to Bangladesh to do this. Um, 
but equally if um, you have contacts in the area and you would like us to do a presentation to budding marine scientists in Bangladesh and feel like maybe they're not getting um, um, as much information as they could have done, we'd be happy to try and uh, organize that for something. Um, if you have a university that you're specifically thinking of that might benefit um, from uh, an online event, um, we definitely like to help um, um, as best we could. But with regards to going to Cox Bazaar, I don't think that is, is, is going to be likely in the near future. Um, but if we can offer our help um, through an online event, we, we would be, um, it would be possible. Yeah, the only thing I would mention um, on top of that is maybe um, check out ReefWatch India. Um, Tara over there at ReefWatch India is a wonderful person and she might know more about some local resources that can be there to help you. She does operate out of the Andaman Islands there as well. Um, so, so she might be a good local partner for you to reach out to. Yeah, um, I would be interested, but as well, because, so do send us an email about because I, well, I went I went to Bangladesh last year and really tried to because there was a potential that um, my girlfriend was going to go work in Dakar. So I was like, oh, well, let's see what I can do there. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, I would always be interested in what's going on in a, in a country. And I really couldn't find much going on in, in Bangladesh that uh, in, the, in the time I looked. So, um, yeah, if you do, if there is something, I'd love to know about it. I would, too. I want to go there. <laughs> I'd love to go there. A fun country. <laughs> yeah. So we got one more question here. Uh, we're welcome to. You're welcome to send more questions. Um, but we have one more here, and it's uh, from Anthony, and he's asking about if the the program at Gilly Conservation will start up again. And the answer is yes. Um, we had just had a meeting with the owner of um, Blue Marlin, who which is the, the dive center that Leon operates his conservation program out of. And Rowan is not only wanting to continue that program, but he wants to expand it. Um, so not only will are we currently on Gilly Air, um, but we are hoping to also have um, centers on the other Gilly Islands and to create an even kind of larger hub for conservation diver within Indonesia. Um, integrating other partners in that area um, that, that we have relationships with, like the Gilly Shark Trust. Um, so yes, absolutely, that program will go on and it's only gonna get bigger and better. Um, Leon's done an incredible job with that program already and um, we will find a way to make that program continue. Um, at the moment, Leon is back at home and doing some incredible work with artificial reef development, working with some companies to develop new artificial reef techniques and materials. And so we're totally supporting that. And we have a lot of instructors on our team who, if Leon is going to stick with that job at home for a while, those instructors would be more than happy to go and <laughs> take over his, his program there and, and keep it going so that, um, so that all the work that Leon's put in can continue. And so, yes, we will definitely have that program going and we definitely love to see you uh, go and help out and join on that. And he, uh, Anthony also added another comment. Can I help? Um, yes, please help. Um, we'd love to have you there helping out as an intern or a volunteer or assistant. Um, but if you think you wanna be a, one of our trainers and, and one of our instructors start teaching these courses, then we'd love to talk to you more about going down that road. So definitely shoot us an email. Um, so, I, unless I'm wrong, I'm not seeing any other questions. All right, George. No, I think so. I think that's it from everyone. I'll um I'll put in the chat uh, both of our emails. So, um, if people do want to send us some questions directly, they can do. Um, but yep, I think that might be everything. Wonderful. Well, once again, I'd just like to say thank you to you all for coming today. And I hope that this has been valuable to you guys. I hope that you've learned something. And I'd just like to reiterate, you know, the, the reason why I thought that this was a good idea to kind of do this with, you know, advertising within the marine biology and marine bio groups on social media is just that I see so many students asking about how can I get 
into this field. If I don't have a degree in marine biology, if I have a degree in something else, you know, I, I want to help out and I want to give contribute to the protection and the saving of the oceans. And so again, you know, don't feel limited because you're not a marine biologist. That has to be the takeaway home, the take home message of all of this is um, get involved. We need you. We need people from all backgrounds. We need people who have all skills. We need people from different ways of thinking and different ideas, different imagination or creativity to be addressing this problem um, because there is no silver bullet. There is no one way that we're gonna save the coral reefs or, or the marine ecosystems around the world. And so any way that you can contribute, we need you contributing. And any skills that you have, develop those skills well and then figure out a way to, to use those skills for ocean protection. Because although marine biology is the most kind of packed out trail towards this, it's not the only trail. I like to think of this field as kind of like a ski slope. And when you go skiing and there's fresh snow on everything and one person goes down and makes a track, <laughs> everybody else kind of goes down the same track. And except for the good skiers, they're the ones that are out where no one else is skiing. And um, in the same way, using that metaphor for the oceans, we need all the people who aren't gonna go down the same track as everyone else. Um, we need people who are gonna make their own way down the mountain and um, start to find new ways of addressing these issues. And so if, if your background's in computers or something else, we need you. Um, we don't just need marine biologists. And I would almost say to some point, we have too many marine biologists. And so if you're not a marine biologist, you're almost more attractive um, as an employee, in my opinion, sometimes. Um, so, so thank you guys again so much for joining. I hope that this has been helpful. And again, as George mentioned, we're here. So reach out to us um, and we really appreciate you. Yeah. And George, do you have something else to add? Only that, um, as Chad said, we want to try and make ourselves as, as available as possible to anyone wanting to get into a career like this. So um, one thing we are going to try and do on the back of this, this, um, these calls is we're launching a site called Patreon. Um, this will hopefully give any of you the ability to continue any mentoring ship you would like from us uh, going forward. It's a, it's a new platform to us. We're, we're, we're experimenting with ourselves. So um, it essentially will give you um, various different access to our team um, as far as uh, it goes to week, weekly sessions and discussions about career with Chad or any other of our board members to um, we're putting together video series on basics of instruction conducting um, conservation diving to how to start businesses in conservation diving. So um, if this is something in a career you guys would really like to get into, then um, maybe this would be something that you guys would be interested in, in too. Um, and if you'd like to see Chad's lovely face and mine um, more, then um, it may be a good route to go down. So I will just put that link in uh, chat for everyone to um, have a bit, have a look at it. As I said, it's new to us as well. So um, um, hopefully we, we will succeed in producing some great content. Um, um, but we'd love to see you guys again on that. And um, yeah, um, we wish you all the best of luck in, in whatever you decide to do. And, and yeah, believe in yourself and, and you'll get. Absolutely. Thank you all very much for joining. And um, definitely, as George said, you know, if you want more of this, just let us know and we'd be happy to do another one and happy to see you all again. So thank you all very much and enjoy your rest of your day or evening, whatever the case may be. And uh, we hope to see you again. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Chad. Cheers all.